As we continue to ring in the new decade, 2020, I am now standing here with Acting Police Chief James McIsaac in the temporary police facility at 40 Woodland Street. Chief, uh, Acting Chief James, Jamie McIsaac was actually appointed to be the new chief on December 9th. And while contract uh, negotiations are happening, he has been named the acting chief as of December 31st because police chief Richard McLaughlin officially retired that day. So it's really an honor to be standing here with you uh, right behind your desk in this temporary facility. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that contract neg negotiations are still ongoing, and possibly when this airs, it will be it will be official. I do hope that everything goes the the way you would like it to go. I I think every I'm confident things will work out just fine. It's really exciting. I mean, it's just so exciting for you when you look back at the past decade. As you know, and you you've been the assistant chief for seven years. Seven years. So almost that past decade. And I mean, did, did you ever think that in, in the next decade, you know, that you would be the, the police chief? Well, I always knew, um, you know, Chief McLaughlin was going to work up until the his till he could no longer work anymore. He turned 65. So uh, I always anticipated that that day would come. But, um, you know, it's just been ex it's been exciting. And I've been real, you know, honored to work and, and serve under Chief McLaughlin. Uh, the last seven years as his assistant chief. And there was a process that you had to go through, like just to, you know, as, as out of fairness, uh, I guess this happens with every department, that there has to be a search process and then an interview process. Yes, and, uh, you know, we had great inside candidates. Um, you know, people stepped up, and I think it spoke very highly of our department and the caliber of people we have here. And uh, there was the process that the town chose. It started actually in June, uh, so it was a lengthy one. But um, it was, you know, I think it was necessary, and uh, I think everything worked out, at least for me it did. So it's going to be a happy new year, right? Yes, yep. We're looking forward to a new year, 2020, and uh, very excited about it. So as you, before we start talking about the year, the, the, the new decade, let's look back at the last decade and the changes that happened, one of them being the... Um, construction of the police station you know it's now it's under renovation which is why we're in this temporary facility yeah so i think it, it, the talk of a new police station began around 2006 maybe 2005 and um you know and then when chief mclaughlin uh, took over in 2007 uh, the, the the talk was rekindled and it went through a different you know bunch of different phases we were going to move into the library if we get a new library uh, one area was talked about was down here where we are now but um, this past year, you know, the, the town stepped up. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of convincing people that we needed a new building. It's since 1931, and the town uh, has come together. The, the other departments in town have all helped us um, immensely. And, um, you know, it's just uh, it's great. We're, we're, we're renovating the new, uh, the new station, and uh, we're excited about it. How is that going? How's the renovation going? It's going very well. Um, right now, from we, we meet every Wednesday with the architect and, and the construction company and uh, representatives from the building committee. And uh, I don't want to jinx the project, but right now I think we've they've gotten to the point where if there was anything uh, that was going to cause any major delays in the project, we've passed that point right now. So they're talking about as early as maybe October, um, early December, that we would move in there. Is that earlier than they originally thought? 
Um, I think it's right on target for what they thought. And, um, you know, there's some neat things that are going on. They they, they discovered that there was uh, oak hardwood floors that are still in pretty good shape that in certain parts of the building we're going to be able to refurbish them. And um, it's just going to – this is a long-term fix. It's not a, a, a short-term fix. So uh, this this building will serve the town for a number of years to come. I recently got a tour with uh, Tom Gatsunas, the project manager, and – I was really amazed to see the footprints of where that addition is, is going to go. They were putting in the foundation. I'm not sure how far along it is now. Yeah, it's quite, a, um, you know, w- when you go there and you look, it's it's really quite a, uh, a project that they're doing, especially in terms of excavating. Um, but we've worked close with Mike Smith, who's on uh, the committee, is from the uh, Historical Commission. And uh, I think the buildings will look great. I mean, Mike has put so much time and effort in ensuring that the windows are, are properly selected and, you know, the, the brickwork and everything is going to remain, um, you know, historically accurate for the town. Have they started framing yet, the addition? No, not yet. They're, they're pouring the, the footings and the foundations um, as we speak. It's kind of good that we've had a somewhat mild winter, right? Yes, it has, yeah. And, this, you know, I've, I've learned so much from the project. You know, this is what, what's great about this job at times. You never know what you're going to be doing. And I've learned so much just from listening to the architects and the builders and, uh, and everybody. It's just been, it's been a good experience for me. Well, let's talk about the, the new decade, 2020, and what you think will be the major changes that will be happening. What are your predictions for, for the next decade or your hopes? You know, it's, it's very difficult to tell. I think we're, we're in such a, uh, you know, technology right now is moving so fast. And, uh, and, and the, tech, the changes in technology are affecting us in ways that uh, I never anticipated as a police officer. You know, we have, uh, we, we've, we've, in an effort to become more transparent, we use social media, you know, whether it's Twitter or Facebook and, and our website. And oftentimes you find that um, when things happen nationally, they'll, even though we didn't have anything to do with it, at Belmont Police as, as, as a group, you know, something could have happened, uh, you know, a thousand miles away, like the, the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. Yet there's an expectation that we're going to react um, in a way to that. And the, the, the expectations are legitimate. So, I think news and, and, and news cycles and social media just spread so fast um, that, you know, we have to stay up with that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of good from that comes from that, and there's a lot of negative stuff that comes from that. And, you know, we see it when we post things on Facebook, and I'll see some of the comments, and, and you got to determine if they're actually even Belmont residents or if they're not somebody, you know, around the world that's just, you know, throwing their two cents into a conversation or trying to stir a conversation. So... It's, uh, it, it, you know, it's exciting. You know, it's a great time to be alive, right, when you have these things happening and, um, you know, the, the technology is just changing so quickly. Now, in your presentation that you gave during your public interview, when you were interviewing for the police chief position, you, you talked about a lot of these um, changes that you're hoping to make, and one of them w- did have to do with, with technology. I think you said you want to get more training because you actually have a lot of computer uh, equipment that you, some of you don't even know how to use, right? Yeah, so one of the things, you know, police agency, police departments, uh, historically, you know, you, you, you hire police officers. So we hire police officers, and then we try to make one of the police officers, you know, a quasi-IT person or a quasi-software person. Well, they... That's not what they really signed on for, and um, and it's, so it's it's difficult for them to stay involved. And we have uh, scheduling software that's pretty confusing to use. Captain Her uh, kind of got a hold of it, and he was in charge of it. Well, he's he's since retired, so now we're all kind of trying to figure out um, how to utilize this software to the best of our abilities. So I think sometimes where historically you would hire an officer. And then assign them to the to sort of what I call back office stuff. I think that we should we should look maybe at um, even if we had to give up an officer's position to bring civilians in that could maybe help with some of that administrative duty. Um, that rather than tie up a, a a police officer, especially one at the rank of captain, um, to do you know just day to day administrative stuff. I, I would also like to ask you about some of the other changes that you plan to make as the new chief. And you can hold the microphone. 
Well, the, I was very fortunate, as I mentioned before, that uh, to serve under Chief McLaughlin and um, under his leadership. And the chief has done a fabulous job of uh, building bridges within the community and creating efforts for us to collaborate with many different people. And I just want to build on that. Uh, I want to, um, you know, keep that going, the collaboration. I would like to try to involve more people within the department in it um, at some of the lower ranks, maybe, um, you know, as a way to delegate those sort of assignments to people within the agency. And, you know, I come from a, back, a strong sports background, coaching and everything, and I really believe that attitude um, is, is very important. It's important for people's health and their well-being. And as a, as a leader in, in any organization, you have an obligation to make sure that the, the people under you um, excel. And uh, that's what, you know, I, I really want to do with one of my goals is, is to, is to um, you know, maximize the, uh, the potential of all of our employees and make this, uh, you know, which it is already a, a good place to work. And um, at the same time, serve the residents of Belmont and provide them with excellent police services. How would you describe the morale of your current staff here? I think the morale is good. I think it's been, it's been high. You know, um, anytime, you know, when I, when I went through my interview process, I, I had, I have this, you know, personal philosophy that I adhere to that is, um, you, you're either growing or you're dying, you know, and you never maintain. And, um, you know, that's one of my fears. Is it, we were just talking about it today early with a couple of officers. I was explaining that. I said, you know, if you, if you reach a level in your employment, you know, and you're satisfied with that, that's fine. But e at least outside of work or whatever, you always got to try to improve yourself uh, as a person, improve yourself as a police officer. And, um, you know, that goes for any stage of your life, whether you're a young person, an old person, or any organization. You know, when you, when you try to maintain, I really believe you have, you have less things to, to celebrate. You, you never come up with any good ideas. And, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of my philosophy. And I would like to see, I like to see people here. We talk about it. Try to get involved in the community in some way. Um, you know, that's a positive way and try to be significant to people um, in, in their lives. I know that there's definitely opportunities for some, maybe some other internal staff to move up because there's a captain position and there will be an assistant chief position. How 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 will that how will those positions be filled? Have you determined that yet? So the assistant chief's position is is my pick. That was um, when Chief McLaughlin came. Um, they 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 negotiated with the supervisors union. And they eliminated a lieutenant's position to give the um, the chief the pick of the assistant chief because the chief is the only person in the department that's non-unionized and non-civil service. So when you make the assistant chief, they leave the union. And so you have somebody that you can talk to without having to worry. You know, the assistant chief's not going to be violating the union and, and vice versa. So um, the assistant chief's pick is the chief's pick. The captain's position is within civil service, so in about six weeks we'll have an assessment center uh, for the captain's position. And, you know, we really need to fill those. I'm finding out very quickly <laughs> that um, we, really, we really need to fill those two positions um, to take care of some of the duties around here. And, and both those positions will be posted, right, like a regular job, and, and there'll be an interview process, but not necessarily like a s search committee like there was for you. No, it won't be. Um, the The... The assessment center, you know, we follow the guidelines for civil service, but the assistant police ch chief's job um, doesn't have to be anything too fancy for that. It's very exciting. Do you think there'll be a lot of interest? I hope so. Okay. Well, as a Belmont resident, you're a fellow Belmont resident, and you're a, more of a Belmont resident than me. You grew up in Belmont. What are your hopes for the next decade? I hope that, um, you know, th th there's some challenges facing the town for sure. You know, we're, we're a town of homes. Um, we, we, all our tax revenue comes, 80% of it comes from real estate tax. The schools right now, are, are, you know, are bursting at the seams. Um, so hopefully when this, the high school project gets built, you know, the, the, the school will have more, you know, control over, over the students in, in a way of, you know, numbers-wise and teacher-student-teacher ratio. And, you know, I think the town's 
done a good job of managing growth. I think that the neighboring communities have exploded. Um, and, you know, and that all has an effect on us. And that's where we as the police, especially in terms of traffic, you know, everyone com has always historically complained about traffic, but it's, it's worse now. And um, people need to, you know, uh, they need to understand that regardless of how much enforcement we do, you know, the traffic's not going to go away. And um, I'd like to see the, the mass transit improve. Um, we have great, you know, mass transit availability within our community. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see that improve um, statewide. And, um, you know, I, I think, though, the town, you know, historically we're a good town. We have good people. And that's really what it, what it comes down to. We have intelligent people that we can rely on, a whole, you know, network of, um, of different issues. We can call on certain people. So I, I think we'll be okay. But, um, you know, there'll, there'll be some bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm sure, like, you'll agree that over the past 10 years, there's been a, tr a trend, a growing trend where traffic has worsened. Um, what other trends has there been that you that you see continuing in the next decade? I'm sure traffic will continue to be a trend. <laughs> traffic and um, the other thing that we've, we've seen increase from a law enforcement perspective that goes hand in hand with the technology is the fraud um, over the whether it's over the telephone or it's over the internet and you know this is where you get in that generational gap where you have people who are savvy and, and you know you, you older people have, are used to, from the majority of their lives they dealt with everything over the phone call over the phone you know the gas company called them or something didn't send them an email and so you have people that, um, whether it's fraud through banking or whatever, um, you know, the technology today allows you to make fraudulent documents that look real, um, you know, and, and, and they're taking advantage of people. The, the fraud numbers are, you know, are, are through the roof. I mean, I had my credit card uh, compromised, you know, two weeks ago. We don't know why, but it got, you know, throughout Worcester County, it got used for two days. And um, so... Those will increase, and you know that that has uh, that has implications, you know, nationwide. When you think of the billions of dollars that's being lost by these institutions, and um, so I think we'll see that. And I think as a community, um, and I you know want to jinx us, but I think crime in Belmont has actually gone down in the last you know six or seven years, and um, you know we're uh, you know we kind of mostly gauge that by our arrests and our crime reports, but the sort of nuisance things have increased because of the number of people that have increased. You know, noise complaints, traffic complaints, those kinds of things. What about the opioid epidemic? Is that getting better? Our our records indicate that it is getting better. Um, I hope that uh, I think you know this the opioid ep epidemic is is. Uh, um, you know, a good example of how police agencies can't do it alone. You know, it took the federal government to get involved. It took calling out these these drug companies, you know, re-educating doctors on, on, on when to prescribe them. And we have we don't have the, um, the overdoses that we were having two or three years ago, but what's more frightening now is uh, the fentanyl has replaced heroin. So now um, our drug detective that works with the Middlesex County Suburban Task Force tells us that he, they're just finding fentanyl now, uh, not even heroin. You know, it's just, uh, it, just a fentanyl cut with another substance, and, and that's, that's scary because then you have people that overdose that, you know, um, shouldn't have overdosed. We, we have the potential in Belmont um, to get two marijuana recreational retail stores, um, how will, what do you think about that and how that will affect your job and, and public safety in Belmont? So w with what I know about the, the, uh, the stores themselves probably won't po pose a pro problem other than traffic. What concerns me from a law enforcement perspective is the, um, if they allow deliveries like the state does or, you know, you worry about somebody who, picks up a large quantity and is leaving the facility and might be targeted um, for robbery or whatever. But the, de the, the deliveries is where you'll have the issues, you know, because you're going to have delivery uh, drivers driving around with cash and, you know, there's marijuana in there. Speaking with, uh, we spoke, we had a meeting with a company that wants to go into Pleasant Street. 
And they talked about mitigating traffic through the use of uh, apps and things, most like you do with Dunkin' Donuts. You put your order in for your coffee, so it's waiting when you get there. So they, they, you know, they, they know that people have concerns when they come in, and this, they spend a lot of money to address those concerns. Will you be talking to, to other towns who have these facilities to maybe compare notes or, or see how they've, the issues that they've had and how they've dealt with them? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we do. And, you know, they, I know they work for the industry, but they, they hire a consultant and one of the, um, the one who does the law enforcement side for one of the companies we talked to is from New Hampshire, where they have his community had both a dispensary and a grow. And he described it to us that he tried to stop it, but then he realized, you know, you can't, it, it, the laws, you know, it's, it's, it's gone through. So he embraced it. He learned as much as he could about it. And he said, uh, you know, that he, they really have no issues. And, you know, now he works for as a consultant. Uh, and he's usually the first person that, you know, we'll reach out to when someone's uh, coming into town. What about school safety and keeping students safe, especially with the new school that's going to be bigger and definitely opening within the next decade? How are we going to keep our students safe? So uh, we have, you know, an SRO at the middle school. We have an SRO at the high school. They'll both be at the new high school. Uh, this, you know, the, the high schools, um, we meet, uh, you know, we've probably had a number of meetings on school safety, whether it's the cameras, the entrances, um, the windows. And, you know, the team, the building committee uh, that's doing the school project have been receptive to all of our ideas, all of our thoughts, um, I've never heard the word, no, we, we're not going to do that or we can't do that. And um, John Phelan deserves a ton of credit. I mean, uh, he's, in, he's in, in these meetings and he's, you know, drilling down to the very detail on certain things. And, um, you know, so from a physical aspect of the school, uh, we're going to be all right. You know, we need to keep training the school, the, the staff and the students on, um, you know, the incident drills that, they, that can occur and uh, make people aware, um, you know, of, of of what their expectations are, what the expectations are if there's an event in the school. But that's, I said it in our interview uh, standpoint, that's one of our strong points right now with, with the department. We've never had a relationship like this before with the schools like we have now. Any reason why they can't have metal detectors in the new building? <laughs> Everyone, you know, metal, de well, think about it. I mean, you then you need to staff it, right? Because when the kids are coming in, um, you know, everything would be triggering the metal detectors. And, you know, at the same time, you know, when, when we talk about uh, school safety and, you know, active shooter incidents, you know, you talk about probability versus possibility. Is it possible it could happen? Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to happen again somewhere, right? But the probability, you know, you don't want to turn these schools into jails. And, you know, there's still schools. they got to be inviting the people, inviting to the kids. There's actually studies that, you know, in different parts of the world, like in Vietnam, where they took schools and they walled them in and everything. And it's really not good for the kids and it's not a conducive learning environment. So I think through technology and through uh, the design team, there's some security features built into the new school that you wouldn't notice um, when you walk in there. And uh, I think they've done a really, a really excellent job on it. What would you say, what would you say is the biggest um, public safety concern in Belmont? I mean, I, I do the logs every week with Lieutenant Daly and mm -hmm. usually there's, it's mostly traffic issues. Um, there are domestics and, um, you know, I was just surprised that, like, New Year's Eve, nothing really <laughs> happened in Belmont. You know, you would think there would be something in the reports. Well, I can tell you, New Year's Eve traditionally has been a quiet time for us. When I first became a patrol officer, um, you know, I volunteered, you know, to work New Year's Eve because I thought it would be a lot of action. And, you know, Belmont, it's almost like it's July in the summer here on New Year's Eve. I think they celebrate, but they celebrate somewhere else. <laughs> And um, even in 2000, you know, when the, the, the turn of the century, when it, it was supposed to be mayhem, right? We were all in here and work. I think we had extra staff on, and it was one of the quietest nights I ever worked. Um, so, you know, people at Belmont are great. And, um, you know, I, I think that there, are, there is a tendency that people go elsewhere to, uh, to celebrate or they go out to a restaurant or, or things like that, or they're, or they're already away with their families on, um, on vacation. 
So as we wrap up, I'm going to ask you one more question. What is a change that you would really like to see happen in the new decade in Belmont? Well, not only in Belmont, but I, I guess throughout the country, um, you know, this last decade has been a tough one uh, considering police and, and community relationships throughout the country. Um, that's had a, had a negative impact on us. I think less young people want to become police officers now because of a lot of the negative press we've gotten. And I just hope that, uh, you know, moving forward, that as a country and as a community, um, that people become, uh, you know, we're right now we're, we're, st we're standing on each ends of a football team uh, politically and a lot of times uh, culturally. And I hope that we can get more into the, you know, into the same arena with each other and, um, you know, knock down some of those walls that's created a lot of division uh, in, in, in the country and somewhat in the community. And, um, you know, hopefully that'll be a, a springboard to get us, you know, to move this country ahead in, in the future. Thank you, and I wish you luck in your new role as Belmont's new police chief. <laughs>